Azur, um, and um, also um, um, uh, Shintaro Fuji, who is a great scholar and also a dramaturg in Japan, who also flew in uh, uh, from Japan just for this evening to be here with all of us. And, um, and uh, his uh, a graduate student also who works at the university with him, Christina Rosner, who's a Hungarian and a dramaturg, also a young director, and who was her research also is in this film. So I think this is truly an extraordinary lineup, and we will hear things uh, that has not been as much talked about as it uh, should be. It's a great field, robots, and the idea of robots will be changing our society, will be part of a second industrial revolution, and to find out what it might mean for our field uh, is truly exciting. Thank you all also for coming. Thank you for the Japan Foundation. We have three representatives here. Maybe you can wave to say thank you. This is the ones um, who uh, helped us uh, this uh, truly luxurious, uh, in a way, event happen to bring all this, everybody over just for this evening and for this exchange. It's extraordinary, but I think it's truly worth it and it's real research and a uh, transatlantic artistic encounter that uh, is uh, um, invaluable. So thank you for the Japan Foundation and uh, our admiration for the great work the Japan Foundation does. Check out their websites, uh, what they do in the programs. It is truly, uh, I think, a leading organization in the world when it comes to uh, global and cultural exchange. Thank you. We also have a, a great audience here, so uh, so many uh, p great people are here. So thank you all for coming and taking time out uh, on, a, on a nice day, uh, maybe another la last warm Monday uh, not on Monday, Thursday evenings uh, this year. So thank you all. My name is Frank Henschke, and I'm the executive director and director of programs at the Siegel Center. And we bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And this event is truly all what is our work about. Um, the evening shouldn't last longer than uh, 19 minutes. And if you have a cell phone, I'll do the same. Just to take a moment um, to check if the... Uh, it's offline and uh, the cloud. <laughs> there will be also a little reception uh, uh, after the event here in case in the Q&A you were not able to be able to ask all the questions. You can do that afterwards. Again, thank you all for coming. And now I hand over uh, to uh, Peter. Thank you. Thanks so much, Frank. And once again, thank you to the Japan Foundation for supporting this event. This is actually an event that's... Uh, uh, a new experiment for the uh, for the program, the theatre studies program at the Graduate Centre, and in partnership with the Siegel Centre, and we have here uh, very distinguished artists from the United States, from New York, and from Tokyo and Japan, and uh, a group of people who are both working in scholarship on aspects of Japanese and Western performance, and who are also working in performance practice as well. So we're kind of working in between the kind of ideas about theatre and performance and, uh, and uh, their practice. This is an event that's going to take place over two days. Today we had uh, the wonderful performance from Nibrol. Now we're having a, a symposium tonight and then tomorrow we'll have a workshop uh, where we'll uh, engage in a, in, a, in a sort of longer conversation, I think, uh, uh, around ideas of robot dramaturgy and object performance. And uh, um, we can talk more about that uh, at the drinks after the session if you're interested. I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a background to the project. So um, for a number of years now, we've been working uh, around ideas of robotics in performance. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of real robots in performance now, uh, active robots being used in various ways. Um, there's, of course, Hirata Oizawa's famous uh, robot theatre where he has a mixture of live actors and um, uh, actual uh, uh, robots on the stage acting in, uh, in real time in in a dialogue with each other. Um, but there's all sorts of other forms of robotics that are being used in performance, whether it's uh, various kinds of augmented robotics or whether uh, we can talk about objects that activate the space in certain ways, like, for example, uh, the, the beautiful work with the houses here and the way that that uh, augments the reality of the performance space and creates a certain kind of um, object performance. And so... Today we're going to talk about the robot, but we're also going to talk about the broader context of that and the way in which objects themselves, uh, non-human forms, uh, are starting to perform in the space in all sorts of ways. Um, and we also have this interesting dialogue now with theatre makers where very often um, many of them are no longer distinguishing, the, for example, between a, a live actor and a, a robotic agent or an object in performance. And 
when you talk to theatre makers, they say, well, um, of course, live humans and robots are different things and they have different needs and, you know, they require different forms of uh, directing, perhaps. Um, but when, when, when they start to think about the way in which these things operate in an aesthetic format, in, in an aesthetic frame, the way in which they perform, um, there's a kind of levelling out of the difference between the two. And in many instances, they're working in very close symbiotic relationships where uh, the, the kind of difference between the human agent and the robotic or object agent uh, has significantly declined or there's a kind of uh, strategic blurring between them. So th that's, that's a sort of little bit of background to, to some of the ideas that we're going to explore in this um, Robot Dramaturgy Forum tonight. But um, uh, I'm, uh, I've got the privilege of chairing this panel uh, and uh, the panel will, each, each of the presenters will have uh, 10 minutes uh, to present some of their ideas about these questions. And uh, I've asked them to respond to these questions in a very broad way, so we'll get quite a diverse set of responses, I think. So um, uh, we, we haven't actually organised a, a running order of things, but I am going to introduce uh, <coughs> Professor Cody Poulton first because <coughs> I know something about what each of these people are going to do, so I'm going to do a little bit of dramaturgy as I go and try and construct some kind of relationship between the conversations here tonight. So um, first 10 minutes is uh, Professor Cody Poulton from Victoria University in Canada. And Cody, if you don't know, his work is uh, very much focused on, I think, the, the whole of the modern and contemporary literary and performance field of Japanese. He's an extraordinary... Uh, extraordinarily wide-read scholar in the field and also doing historical uh, um, theatre studies as well. So thank you very much and thank you for coming, Cody. Thank you. Um, could you run the clip that I wanted to show first, please? How was it? Like the town, it seems like there are less and less people. Mm -hmm. を見る。昼は色んな人と話をする。そしてきっと一番好きなものを見つける。見つけたら大切にして。死ぬまで生きる。だから遠くにいても Thank you. Um, so what we just saw was a preview to a, a film that was uh, premiered at the Tokyo International Film Festival uh, this fall. And it's a film adaptation of two short android plays by Hirato Oriza uh, using the android uh, that was designed by uh, Ichiguro Hiroshi. Um, and you can get a sense here that it's kind of post-apocalyptic kind of setting. There has been a nuclear disaster, an evacuation. Um, this American woman uh, is left behind 
with an android and in fact she's suffering from a mortal um, disease uh, so she's facing death um, and uh, I wanted to mention and no doubt this was something of a gimmick but uh, the android was nominated for a best actress award uh, <laughs> at the, <laughs> at, the uh, at, at the Tokyo International Film Festival which I think was an insult to Briar Lee Long who was the American actress who has uh, consistently ever since the, the beginning and from the stage plays onward uh, to the film version uh, has been performing. So um, my question uh, is uh, can uh, a post-human theory of acting exist? Um, uh, can an android win the best actress award? Um, Peter and I were at a conference uh, this uh, summer in Paris where Philip Auslander uh, was talking about uh, Andy Serkis's um, 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 renderings of Gollum and, and Caesar and, and, and Planet of the Apes and, uh, and dealing with the debate as to whether uh, somebody like that could get a Best Actor award. Um, and he said uh, his, his conclusion was no, he shouldn't get it. Um, there's no inferiority in the performance of, of, of um, Andy Serkis in these things. Um, and uh, it's all about motion capture. Um, perhaps uh, the uh, people who do the CG for that kind of thing should get um, technical awards, but, but it's not acting. I asked Briarly, um, did she think that Geminoid F was acting? Um, and what was it like to act with an android? Um, is it different from acting uh, with a human being? Um, and I got some interesting answers back from her. Um, and she said um, the Geminoid F is an actor in the same way that a puppet or a mask are actors. Uh, she has a strong presence and identity. However, she only comes to life when she's operated by people in the same way that masks and, and, and puppets do. Um, so for Geminoid F to act is for life to be given to the inherent form and character that she has. Um, and again, she can't do this alone, but the identity of the character on stage is defined by her body as it is for anyone else who's acting. Is it possible to act without subjectivity as the audience usually imposes their, uh, sorry, it is possible, one of the questions I ask is, can, can an android act if it doesn't possess agency, subjectivity, will, consciousness, all of these things? And she says, it is possible to act without subjectivity as the audience usually imposes their own subjectivity on the characters. Um, and the reactions to Geminoid F, for example, have been very different um, in uh, the US or in Japan. Um, so in a sense, we project our emotions onto the blank screen, somewhat blank screen of, of, of the android's face. Um, and uh, if she's manipulated, uh, she herself is a kind of a shell, but if she is manipulated well, then she acquires a soul in the same way that a mask would do. Um, and she has adapted her style of acting um, to the android in order to create a consistent atmosphere on stage. Now, um, Hirata has said a couple of things about his collaborations with Ichiguro. Um, one thing is that if you go to uh, one of these uh, big technical exhibitions to see androids perform, you might have androids playing the violin, androids walking up and down stairs, uh, androids, I don't know, singing um, uh, Daisy Daisy as in Belle, you know. Um, but these are just kind of tricks and they don't move us emotionally. So he wanted to create a kind of an environment, a setting in which um, uh, robots and androids could move us emotionally in a kind of a theatrical performance and, and, and that can only be done within the context of some kind of dramaturgy. Um, and his directorial style is famous for creating a kind of a hyper-realistic atmosphere um, on stage um, but with means that are the antithesis of the kind of Stanislavskian method acting. So there's no interiority in the in, 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 in the directorial or the dramaturgy, so, uh, dramaturgical style. Uh, and he programs his actors in the same way that he would program machines. Uh, his, his directions are extraordinarily precise so that performance time 
uh, from, from, from one night to the next of a play may differ by no more than a few seconds, less than a minute. It's incredibly precise, precise. Now, I want to throw out a couple of theories which I think are analogous that will allow us to kind of unpack the, 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 the notions of the human and the non-human, the subject and the, the object, uh, things like free will and determination, sort of heavy philosophical ideas. And one uh, that, that Hirata works with uh, certainly has been influenced in his, in his, uh, in his work is uh, the uh, environmental uh, psychology of uh, James J. Gibson. Uh, what he calls a theory of emotion, emotional affordances. Put simply, what a person thinks, says, or does is profoundly determined by his or her environment, both physical and social. And I want to link that to um, another theory of the um, philosopher of sci sci science, uh, Bruno Latour, uh, the actor network theory, uh, which holds that all, all things, both human and non-human, both act and are acted upon caught up in a web of social, material, or technological relations. So I think maybe I'll stop at that point and, and pass the... Thanks, Cody. That's a, that's a really good place to stop, I think, because you've given us a, an idea of, of the way in which Hirata is trying to operate on the robot in a way that is actor-like, and also he's operating in a, in a way that is aware of a kind of network theory, an actor network theory, where... Um, as Latour would suggest, the performance is a very complex environment where uh, the kind of agency of the performance is circulating within a room, within a, within a theatre setting. It's, it's very uh, complicated and interactive and one thing is not determining the other, but uh, things are operating on each other in, as a kind of assemblage. And, and I, I wonder whether you could speak um, a, a little bit, Marianne, about your work with um, Builders Association because your recent performance, for example, was... Just in terms of your recent work, uh, um, Oz, which, which had this experience of reaching out to an audience in a really quite spectacular way, I think. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I might show a touch of video while I'm talking. That makes it more interesting. So, um, as Peter said, we, my company, recently launched this production called Elements of Oz, which maybe you'll see the picture of, I don't know. But anyway, um, in terms of robotics, it really was about, or what we did, oh, thank you. Look, our first collaboration. Thank you. <laughs> so listen, um, <laughs> yes, this one right here. No, no, wait, where did it go? Yeah, that one. <laughs> okay, go team. So, um, no, no, thank you. I didn't realize that it was unplugged. Now it should be happening. We might need assistance, technical assistance. <laughs> really? Okay. All right, I don't want to take any time, more time. So um, what I was thinking about as a point of departure for The Wizard of Oz was um, one of the most intimate robots that we, that we own currently. So it's a robot that you can't... Uh, stand to have out of your sight. It's a robot that tells you where to go and what to do, and you panic when you can't see it, and you depend upon it for so many things, including entertainment, and that is our smartphone. So um, we wanted to engage smartphones as a kind of entryway into Oz, and playing off the idea that Oz itself is a... Um, kind of the apex of escapist entertainment. So the book, which was written by Baum in the late 19th century, was written in a way to, to kind of ev uh, escape from the depression at that time. And then, of course, the MGM Technicolor movie was all about the great escape and being able to go into this other world and Technicolor being a part of that, the sort of heightening of fantasy and the heightening of escape that was very much intertwined with the idea of Oz. And as you might recall, Dorothy goes from black and white Kansas to this very lush world. 
Um, so we created a version of <laughs> a lightly, um, you know, laced version of the Wizard of Oz that what sort of operated on many levels technically. One was we were reproducing sections of the film. Um, the other was that we, we were sort of mining YouTube for various interpretations of Oz because essentially what I was interested in is that Oz is a kind of cultural artifact and that everyone has some relationship to it. It's still one of the most globally watched films in the world and everyone has something to say about it. So on YouTube, like every nut job has some theory that they're circulating about The Wizard of Oz. And so it becomes this kind of beautiful cacophony of interpretations and ownership. Um, I'm sorry. So for instance, some of the theories that we run through, this, through our production are, I'm sure people are familiar with the idea that Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon is the soundtrack to The Wizard of Oz, and if you start that, when the lion roars, that it's, it totally lines up, <laughs> depending on how much you drop that night. And, or there's the theory that Baum wrote The Wizard of Oz during this great bimetallist debate in the US where the um, farmers of the Midwest were pitted against the bankers of the East in terms of the silver standard and the gold standard, and there's this idea that Baum's allegory was that um, the farmers were is, are the scarecrow, the hapless, helpless scarecrow, and the bankers of the East are the wicked witches, of course. So that kind of thing. Um, but what I, so those are various elements. But what I wanted to show you, share with you tonight is an app that we created for the show, um, with no money and basically just blood, sweat, and tears, and was is a integral part of the performance. So. We made this app that you can download um, on your iPhone or Android and that people were asked to kind of activate before they came to the theater. And then we had a little <laughs> like seminar at the top of the show where people are in this Guy Debord <laughs> you know, cover looking at the, so basically we have to set up this idea that everyone needed to point their phones at that target in order to have the, the layer lineup. So what we were doing is using augmented reality. So it's not Oculus, it's not virtual reality, it's not about shutting off, it's about this kind of a addition of layers, transparent layers, so that it's really playing between the live stage and your experience as the viewer and this kind of mixed reality. Um, so th that's what it looks like before you start. And then this is what <laughs> happens during the show. So. As you can see, there's Glinda the Good Witch. And um, so I'm just going to zoom in. Oh, if you can see, oh god, um, down below, right down here, here's Glinda. So what's happening is there's a big bubble that's floating around, and it ends up encompassing Glinda on the screen and on your screen. You're going to, I'll show you in a second. So anyway, these are just images of how it looked. And then I want to just play a, a tiny bit of a trailer because I think hopefully it'll help um, explicate this sweet touch. So, where is it? Perfect. So this means that Basically, when you, the audience would see this sign that says, look up, and they would all pick up their phones and point it to the target on stage. So what you'll see now are some of the things that people saw through their phones that were different than what they saw live in the performance. I'm a college student, right? And I double major in both film and history. The version I and most people nowadays are familiar with is the 1939 film in all its technicolored glory. Okay, here's that sad, middle-aged internet lady with all of her Wizard of Oz stuff. So this is the film that we were making. And then on top of that is this other layer. So that's what you would see on your phone and pick it up. And then this is what you would see in your phone and this is what's happening on stage. So there's a couple of other examples of things you would see. This is entering Oz.
And there's the poppy field, the opium field. There's a couple more examples. Here's one. You got flying monkeys. So I'm just gonna freeze at this. So this is, you know, the finale. Oz is unveiled and there's a final engagement with the film. So I think it might leave it there. I mean, it is kind of a double-edged sword that we were presenting to the audience where you were certainly able to experience the performance without your phone. But there's this um, layer that we're using as a kind of temptation to bring your phone out and turn it on and have that be an active part of the performance. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, it's a really kind of, I, th I think this is something very new. It's, it's a new uh, application of technology. Uh, it's actually a new putting together of bits of technology that pre-exist, such as the iPad and the possibility for um, micro-broadcasting into a, a small location, uh, and also 3D technology coming into play there. And, and the, the augmentation of a live act through this kind of 3D visuality, I think, is really interesting. And it reminds me, I read in the paper the other day that uh, companies like Google are currently spending billions of dollars on headgear to try and um, uh, develop that technology uh, to make it more cheap, more portable, more usable. And you know, I imagine in the future that that might be a possible way of seeing this, this kind of show with, with some kind of virtual reality headgear on. And uh, uh, it, it's very hallucinatory. And, um, um, the, the intensification of the experience through these kind of visual hallucinations, I think, is something really interesting. And um, with that in mind, I, I think I might go to Tina now, if, if you wouldn't mind coming in. <laughs> um, uh, Tina's work is not hallucinatory at all. It's very grounded. But uh, uh, Tina's very interested in the kind of way in which objects speak to us in very powerful ways. And uh, um, so um, Tina Rosner is currently... Uh, postdoctoral fellow at uh, Waseda University in Tokyo. And we've got just a little bit of technology there. Yes, happening. Can I have a tumbler of some sort? Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, this is going to be slightly different presentation from the others. Um, I've been researching uh, the non-human participants in the Eugenician theater, starting from examining the concept of presence and silence of the performer through the appearance of animals uh, in a theatrical situation, turning to the inorganic other, the robots and androids, to see how our concept of theatrical presence is challenged. So today, I'm going to focus on insects and, uh, and an android. Um, in the deeply problematic notion of Western mimesis, uh, the onstage presence of the human being celebrates the primary and distinguished position of the man as an image of God. The theatrical dramatical representation of animals is either degraded to a metaphor of a suspicious counterpole, a bearer of a forbidden and sacred knowledge, Mephistopheles as dog, or to a cute show. This anthropocentrism is even more evident in the relationship of theater and insects. As Chowdhury points out, the human fear of insects is deeply connected to its spatial aspects, to the idea of home that is secure and free from invaders. 
and the insects that are constantly disregarding its boundaries, penetrating through the walls, through the skin. Based on this, we can say that our uh, reaction to the stage fly, uh, that specific fly that flies through the beam of the stage light during the show, um, the animal that accidentally enters the performative space, a territory which is carefully marked by human, is a deeply imprinted reaction keeping the insect out, tamed by the socially traditionally framed theatrical event but not actually getting out of our seats and taking the animal out. Uh, in the case of Kaf uh, Kafka's famous insect, however, theater adaptation already shifts from insect to human. In the majority of the stage productions of Metamorphosis, the insect, Gregor Samza, is played by a human actor. Not an insect, of course. Or is it of course? In his latest piece of the robot theater project, The Metamorphosis, Oriza Hirata sets Kafka's stories uh, in a near future and a small town in France, where one morning, Gregor Samza wakes up to discover that he has transformed into an android. Instead, of showing the intensified physical disgust so strongly present in Kafka's work, the topos of anything can happen and the importance of facing the given situation are emphasized in Hirata's version. The repulsion towards the creature is shifted to the repulsion towards the android, the uncanny valley by Masahiro Mori comes to my view. The absolute focal point of the stage is the neutral white lava-like face of the android which by Hirata's intention evokes the traditional no masks. Hirata's longtime collaborator Ishiguro's primary research ask, uh, asks what human is, whether a core and essential quality exists uh, by which it's possible to define human. In this concept, the shape of the humanoid robot is considered as a shell. The programming and timing of the gestures, facial expressions, and vocal appearances are done by Hirata. In his opinion, programming of emotions refers both to the narrow theatrical sense and the wider humanist approach to the question of reproducing socially pre-programmed and acquired emotions. The most emphatic gestures in the performance are the moments when the mother, Irene Jacob, holds the Andres Gregoire hands, touches his, its face. These gestures emphasize the direct proximity between the human and the android, the physical contact between skin and shell. In this divided closeness, only the voice that connects the two layers of reality, the voice of the android, originally belongs to the actor who plays the role of the tenant, Thierry Rouge. Also, in terms of fictional mode, how does the mother, Irene Jacob, relate to the Grégoire Samza or PAS? One, android statement. What sort of critical remarks can be made in regards of the android's acting? The questions raised and discussed by the characters focus on the cognitive processing of an ex unexpected radical change. My son is a robot. He's French, even if he's not a French maid. Do I, do I have the right to decide who's human and who is not? And most importantly, I think it's me, says Gregoire, the android. This sentence, with Ishiguro's concept of shell, reflects on Descartes' idea of human animals and natural animals operating as machines and raises again the question of the need for profound security. How can we relate to each other? Is it possible to make statements concerning one's own existence? But the meaning of the famous sentence shifts with the context and the person who utters them. From confidently stating, cogito ergo sum, it becomes a hesitant and insecu insecure. I think it's me, said by an android in the voice of a human in a theatrical situation. Eventually, it even might be somewhat comforting to think Chao Dury's remark of Quote, no stage is ever free of insects, invisible or nearly invisible, they are always there, end quote. In this sense, that specific stage fly would become a reminder. Gregor Samza 
the character that is ripped off of not only his human, but its fictional, its insect self, provisions a sterile and infertile environment where one would be grateful for any insect that crosses the stage as a trace, proof, or hope of an organic presence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> really beautiful images, and that I think this relationship between humans and non-humans is uh, something that's becoming very powerful in the theatre now. Also, the concept of technology uh, as a kind of alienated thing, uh, which we saw very powerfully in Acted this afternoon in the performance, um, uh, is something that I think relates to that idea. And certainly <coughs> Kafka's idea, Kafka's metaphor, is something that is at the heart of a lot of our anxieties about um, these kind of transformations that are not only taking place in the world around us, but are also entering and transforming our own bodies and, and making us much more robot-like or cyborg-like. Um, so with, with that um, link in mind or, or segue, I'll introduce now um, the artistic director of Nibrol, uh, Mikuni Yanihara, um, who's going to show us some of uh, their work and talk a little bit now too. So, um, oh, sorry, you're doing it together. I apologize. So also uh, presenting is Keisuke Takahashi, who's the designer and co-founder of Nibrol and was up in the bio box for the performance this afternoon. So this is a joint presentation by them both. Thank you very much. Uh, we have the company named Nibrol. And uh, Nibrol have a choreographer, video artist, musician, set designer, We will have a choreographer, video artist, and a musician, design and various artists.
liberal have choreographer video artist musician set designer and various artists we product dance theater and video art video installation work and uh, we have no single overall director director and we try to make performance of unconventional framework and uh, we explore the possibilities of visual and physical expression. And uh, we also express, we explore a new field by having active communication with other scams. And uh, next is continue. Uh, it, it, uh, it is and also we making in the theater. So this one is a uh, joint uh, festival process. So last year the festival process is a kind of the new uh, work. So can you hear? <laughs> Sorry, only Japanese. So at the first time, so uh, I making for outside. So audience is uh, just outside screen for the they part of the story at the same time. So audience choose so which story uh, choose because the so in the after that so just into the theater. <laughs> so I just change many play writing. And uh, my, my theater is, uh, mm, many people think it's uh, too fast. So speaking is uh, really too fast. So in the many uh, creator and the producer, please try to move slowly. So in, uh, so audience uh, not understand too fast. So, but 
so I choose to the fight. So because uh, <laughs> I really don't like uh, so actor like uh, slowly in the <laughs> feeling so like uh, like a emotion. So then I just everything cut. So try to more faster. So maybe opposite for the Onza Hirata. So <laughs> I, I, I use him too, uh, so much because uh, uh, I have a festival director in uh, Onza Hirata has uh, some small uh, theater. So they have uh, always uh, making some festival. So I working with uh, Onza Hirata. So, and, uh, but uh, I just saw the one time in the rehearsal He's a, he's a robot yeah. and a actor, but uh, that time is, is a robot is a crazy movement. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, I'm really surprised because uh, uh, usually is a robot is correct, so moving. But, so that time, so robot is a crazy <laughs> moving. So it's happening, it's happening, but I like this <laughs> moment. <laughs> So <laughs> I choose the different. So, but so we are something is very close. So because uh, 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 I'm no uh, sorry, three minutes, one minute. One minute. <laughs> okay. So, oh, uh, uh, yeah. So maybe because uh, I'm I'm choreographer. After I became to the playwright, so then I just get a uh, very famous uh, uh, playwright fight, Ishida Kurio, uh, three years ago. So then I make his theater a lot. So, but we are talking about uh, some body. So a uh, robot is uh, just So no, nothing, nothing, but after uh, time slowly comes up, so something here, so stand up. Mm -hmm. So and uh, I just using some moving, so uh, because uh, actor is usually is moving is not good, so really not good. So, because I'm working with dancer a lot, so a uh, first time is surprised. Actor is nothing da dancing, so really so bad. But after maybe one month, so big. So <laughs> just comes up to so something. So movement is not good, but something is here. So then w we are talking. So then. So robot in the really bad body is something cross. <laughs> so yeah. So it's a thing. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really delightful. Um, I think you've really given us some good things to think about, um, some really interesting uh, things to think about there uh, in relation to, first of all, the hyper-expressive -exp nature of, of the bodies in your work because, of course, um, if we see a performance like the one we saw this afternoon, we could choose to read that as a kind of reaction to a certain kind of alienation to a certain city or urban life, a certain experience of trauma is being enacted not just in the text, but actually through, literally through the body and through that kind of hyper-expressive uh, way of speaking. Um, uh, but, uh, of course, <coughs> this, is, this is also a question of embodiment and the way in which uh, actors and dancers embody experience differently and, and express reality differently. But also, with the, the introduction of the robot itself, we have hyper-expressive but very exact movement available for the first time. A robot does things <coughs> absolutely precisely in the same way every time. And whether or not that will influence the kind of choreographic understanding that we have of, of human movement as well is something that we might consider in the question time. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um,
Um, I'm, I'm going now to um, just cross over to Catherine Mezza, who's um, also been thinking a lot about uh, movement and machines. And her work as uh, Catherine is an independent scholar who's worked on Japanese performance for a very long time now. Um, and she's been following contemporary dance in Japan for many, many years. But also her work extends to dramaturgy and working with performers. And um, in the last couple of years, she's become increasingly absorbed with the movement of machines and thinking about the relationship between humans and machines through the kind of codes of dance. So in some ways, this is a very good uh, presentation to carry on from yours, I think, in that there is this extension of the idea of movement into a kind of machinic or machine uh, construct. So thank you, Catherine. And <laughs> over to you. Well, what I want to do a little bit is, uh, it is actually about what I'm calling mater material choreography, or a machinic choreo dramaturgy. And, um, but I'm going to start with a little bit of um, sort of like laying out my field of study. Because if I'm talking about material, I think it's really important to know that I'm talking about stuff. And so, and that stuff is physical, animal, machinic, and it's all around us. And a lot of artists are working with materials in really interesting ways that I think from the little houses to lights um, as well as screens are all material things and that's part of what I think we need to sort of look at. Let me read you one thing so I'm grounded, okay? What <laughs> is the choreographic dramaturgy of a machine, an object, an animal, or a person? And what might that examination reveal about subjectivity, perception, and affect in daily or theatrical events? What Rosie Bredodi and Donna Haraway suggest when they both, in different ways, make arguments for a kind of post-anthropomorphic philosophy that not only decenters and shakes down the hierarchies of the human, but creates a level playing field of humans, animals, plants, objects, light, darkness, and that is at the center of a somewhat minimalist exploration of building a machinic choreo dramaturgy. Now my background, however, crosses over several fields and I'm really involved in the material culture of cue, which makes for really fascinating, um, in a sense, sens sensations. And then that, of course, we're going to have this wonderful talk tomorrow about the Karakuri, or the machinic dolls, that started over 300 years ago. But spanning that is artists today. This is Ai Weiwei's piece that's called At Large that was in San Francisco. Um, and it's, a, it's a actually a metal wing made out of the Tibetans use these, uh, the, these metal plates to collect sun and make heat their tea. I don't know if you can see the teapot on there. But the wing is in a room where the wing can't move. So I'm talking also about the choreog choreography of things, the dramaturgy of things, that where movement is build motion. And I'd like us to think about that in all the work we do. I happen to get to Athens, and I've been so fascinated here by the stones, not the representation, but the thingness of stones. Um, Ai Weiwei, again, this is his ceramics inside objects, the ceramicness of our toilets. Like, what is that as an object? How does it perform? What is that thingness? This is a robot in um, this summer in Tokyo. And then because of this crossover to my work on what I, I call girl culture, it's looking at the thingness of the girl body and what, other, what different artists are doing with objects and things. This is an advertisement actually for an art school. And then my interest in that crossover, so what does the machinic, the robotic, the stuff do to bodies? And are there any bodies there at all? And of course, the cute stuff. And it's wonderful right now in New York, you've got teddy bears everywhere. So I really wanted to start thinking about, you know, what is the teddy bear robot? Whoops, sorry, we have to go back there. Um, these are actually objects in these wonderful toy game windows where there's a, 
a robot arm that comes down. You put in 100, 500 yen, and you have to operate this robotic arm to kind of knock over the little fat, chubby guy to wing it. And people spend a lot of money on this. And then there's the girl cafes, and these are these cat girls, and they're sort of animal robot-like. And animation is another kind of, in a sense, a robotic animation form. This is Konorike um, Kume. You, you, you're going to tell me two minutes, right? Konorike um, Tomoko, who works with animality in, in drawing. She also, I don't have time to show her her sculptures, but this idea, again, de, you know, sort of decentering the, the thing, the human, and, that, and the, her foxes are all six-legged foxes that are all also connected to mythology. And this idea of the splintering glass, again, a kind of materiality that changes both the physicality and the, cor the stillness of choreography. Here's my cat robotic girl, perfect, right? And stay tuned, tomorrow I'm talking about <laughs> becoming a taxi is suspended animation and looking at the ubiquitous train and the actual the operators in the trains and the, that kind of choreographic um, uh, 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 dramaturgy. And but the only other thing I want to leave you with besides a little clip which I'll escape out of and go right to here is that I think what interests me here also is what I call the ethics of things. Because no matter what, this, the materialism here has to do with things that we own and we touch and what kind of, in a sense, rights do we have to those things. And in fact, if you take human out of rights, then that begins to expand the field and make us think very, very differently about performance, both on stage and in our lives. So just to end that, I wanted to show you a group called Chaffee. And to me, what's wonderful about their machinic performance is that it always fails. And I think of failure as something that is machine-like, that perhaps humans need to do better. We can just look at it this way. This was post 3.11. They told me those are the, to, to be the 3D glasses. They wear stockings over their faces. They wear wigs. They, in a sense, make their bodies into machine-like dolls. And all their movements are always, there's always something about falling and failing. So those are the towers that are outside. But it's also their behavior. In a sense, there's a, there's a choreography to the robot, to the human, to the doll, to the girl that's going on here that I think is important in terms of how, how we're dealing with the little houses out here, the way that they burn, you know, and what happened to people when they're sitting in those chairs. So what's, what's the chairness? What's the house? You know, what are we really doing with objects? Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Excellent. Thank you. So there we, we've, we've gone from the robotic figure into, I think, some anthropomorphic forms and into some other um, forms of cultural production, I think very much relating to Japan, uh, including some of the commercial areas and kawaii culture. But it also points to the, to the disappearance of the human from the performance frame. And um, where we very often now, I think, go and experience performances that uh, have no longer live actors in them, or certainly the live actor's presence has been reduced or confused strategically with uh, remote figures in some way. So uh, for our last presentation, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Professor Shintaro Fuji from Waseda University, uh, who's going to ruminate a little bit on this uh, tendency now in some performances to present objects as the actor and scenery as the actor and screens as the actor and a certain kind of visuality or sensory experience as the actor. Um, 
And what is lacking here is it's, it's in a sense the opposite to the kind of uh, hyper-present performers in, in, um, in uh, Liberal's performances uh, where we have this meditation on, on absence and... Um, Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, um, so it's m sorry. Yes, um, I <laughs> I wanted to put my text in the in PowerPoint, but then I, I think I was too jet lagged this <laughs> afternoon, so <laughs> um, I had to juggle with um, two computer um, at the same time. And um, I I would like to begin by this quote by uh, Metalink. It states um, clearly state the distrust for human human performers, which was shared by many of his contemporaries, like Gordon Craig. I would like to come back to this quote at the end and excuse um, um, excuse me again. Uh, it's my own translation I did this afternoon uh, from French, so it's m it could be a bit awkward. Um, but I love. The sentence, the stage is the place where the masterpieces die. It's um, and these artists dreamt of performances where human performers will be replaced by non-human objects, marionettes or super marionettes, shadows, projections or figures. And more than a hundred years later, um, some of uh, some of the most important performing artists seem to shift towards a performance without performers or toward the death of the performer. I think we can discuss today the death of the performer like we did with the death of the author half a century ago or the death of the dramatic characters. Uh, Even though the presence of living bodies um, used to be a necessary condition of the theater, or it still is the necessary condition of the theater, in these performances, human performers are literally absent, or at least they point towards the disappearance of such physical presence. In Europe, um, Tadeusz Kantor, um, uh, with, the, with his theater of death, seems to me um, a pioneer in this shift toward the performance without performers, not only in theory, but in practice. Um, Gisard Vienne, um, uh, who graduated from French National Marionette School, uh, may be a direct inheritor of Cantor. She creates mannequins uh, herself which cannot easily be distinguished from human actors. Um, I can't remember uh, which one was um, um, a human actors and which one was um, the mannequins in this either. And um, Romeo Castellucci uh, created um, Tragedia in the Gonitia in 2002 to 2004. It's a series of 11 performances created in ten uh, different cities. In the second half of this um, M number 10, um, created in 2004, uh, in Marseille, France, uh, M stands for Marseille, and it is the 10th out of the 11 pieces. Um, the public will see the s screens going up and down in different colors that keep changing. Um, but there is only a shadow of a woman who doesn't even speak. Um, Le Sacre du Printemps um, that he uh, created last year um, involved no performer at all, but the ashes of bar burned cars um, coming down from the machines set in the ceiling. Yeah. And... Um, um, 33 rounds and a few seconds, a performance created by, uh, uh, no, sorry, um, there is some, yeah. Rabia Murwe and Lina Sane in 2012 involved no human performers either. 
and I would like to come back to this um, Duny Marlowe's um, the blind piece um, at the end. And now I would um, like to talk about uh, shortly um, about Japanese artists. <coughs> On Japanese side, Nobutaka Kotake uh, um, was one of the first to do shows without any human performers. I think it was around 1990. He was a collaborator of Shuji Terayama and conceived the scenography with machines for him. And I also think of uh, OA or memorandum by dumb type um, where the bodies of human performers are disappearing into immersive images. <coughs> Ryoji Ikeda, a former dumb type member, gives concerts with no one on stage but with projections on the screen filled with computer generated images like this. And uh, Hiroaki Umeda, wor his works go in the same direction in the holistic strata, the space um, generated by this projection in an illusionist way moves much more strongly than his dance actually. Mm. And yeah, and in the end, do you want um, uh, there was a video, um, it doesn't work. Click on the little thing. Okay. So um, it's um, part of the um, technological phantasmagoria that um, Duny Marlow um, uh, did in 2002 um, until 2004. Um, it's made of three different pieces, and uh, the blind is, was the first. Um, it is a short piece in one act written by Maeterlinck in 1890. <coughs> there are um, 12 blind people, six females, six males lost in the middle of a forest and they're just frightened by an invisible threat. There are no living performers. There are only projected images of this, these faces of the two actors onto the 12 heads of mannequins. No bodies, just faces. And six same faces. So even the heads were molded out of the actors' real heads. They're immersing the details such as mouth, um, do not move um, consequently um, with the image. So it gives us the sensation of the Freudian un un uncanny and put us in such an unstable state as the 12 blind characters are in the play. And more cleverly, this um, corresponds to the writing, writing of Metal Link that, that we saw at the beginning. Um, he thought about the stage with no human actors, but with masks, shadows, projections, and marionettes. I still don't know uh, what this perf performance robot dramaturgy can be, but this example, I suppose, is very su suggestive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shintaro. Well, thank you very much for those really wonderful presentations. I think we've... Uh, uh, began 
uh, with, with the contemporary robot, uh, we move through hyper-expressive bodies, we move through augmented reality, uh, we move through some contexts for technology and popular culture and the expressive nature of that. Um, and we also had the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the animal aspect brought into our concern today. So I think we've, we've really been around um, the world of robot dramaturgies and, and explored it from many different angles. Uh, and we ended with the screen, and I think this is a really important place to end because, uh, you know, in some ways, the actual existence of the tangible body of the robot is, is mutating into another formation when uh, screens are coming into play, but also um, biological agents. I think if we look at the actual technological level of, of robotics now, biological agents are coming into being, and that might be a very spooky way to end our session. So first of all, I'd like to thank all our speakers. We do have one or two time, we have about five minutes for questions, but just a round of applause for all of the speakers first. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, so we, we do have five minutes for questions and then we'll have an opportunity to follow up in a, in a less formal way with conversations. But I can see in the dark somebody with their hand up the back there. Would you wait for the microphone to come to you, please? Thank you, a very uh, fascinating uh, um, subject and presentation. Um, and uh, certainly it's uh, very useful and, and uh, re relates to our reality, for better or for worse. But I, I'm a little surprised that no, there's, no, uh, there's no nostalgia present for, <laughs> for the human, <laughs> the so-called human. It, it just missing <laughs> so i i wonder isn't uh, is it, it, it there, are there does it uh, appear in dreams or it just seems to be that uh, that, uh, that we should we pay some we you know we think about that sometimes that, that there's something has happened that reality has changed uh, that another thought is that the idea that or maybe it's a consulting thought the idea that uh, that uh, the robots are a human product. So this, uh, the antipathy between the mechanical and the human um, might be a, a, some kind of illusion. Or are, it will a certain point come where the human is a product of the robot? So these are just scattered thoughts and kind of questions. But thank you so much. I just like to say that um, this idea, there's a, a wonderful article on how objects become things. And within this sort of more philosophical idea, there's this idea as you start thinking about how perhaps things came before humans. So then the idea of like how we make robots become, in a sense, how, the, how materials, in a sense, um, are, are already there. And so is the shaping of it an imitation of the human, or is it rather that we are, um, in a sense, imitating the thing? Yeah, and so you can flip it. Yeah. Well, I was, I was just wondering, um, with this moved over so many different, um, you know, connections, not precisely robotic, but, uh, object-oriented ontology, the question of the object or the thing and so on. So it's, it's so productive and so interesting to me. And I'm wondering if what is, seems not to be in question is the question of performance itself. So still the theatrical model or um, that somehow there's still, pr I, this is, I hope this isn't too negative a kind of question, but um, to the, uh, the whole possibility of performance or there could be death of the performer. I hear that, but where is the are we moving towards the death of performance? Does that have to be mm. somehow mm. returned as a last mm. horizon of, mm. of you know, mm. human or something? Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, the word performance, of course, is, is, um, is 
doubly inflected in relation to, to theatre and machine because performance is a measure of the machine already. So, uh, and it's a constant measure of the machine. We, 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 we describe machines through their performance in there. Um, but the question of the live performance is it will make a live performance experience. And I, I wonder whether. that we're often seeing a, a, a response to the, the to the Um, we're, we're right at the edge of time, so... Um, um, yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> Any final comments from the participants? Uh, I just want to make sure that this isn't so um, strange, you know, like robotic dramaturgy, like something other than what, what's on Broadway, what's down the street, what you do in your classroom, because these are real questions to really wonder, like, with our phones, what is that performance? What do I see that you don't see? Um, when the little houses are out there, the sort of multiplicity of things in my house, like, these things are really vital to all the worlds of performance and need to be asked. 